All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Jeff Meter. We're at Eminent Domain. It's June 14th, 2022. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for coming up. Uh, and the first question, as you know, is why wine? <laughs> um, that was a kind of roundabout opportunity. Uh, we started um, in 2001, 2002. Uh, my stepfather and I had an opportunity to buy the old Pillsbury Pie Factory and we started Oregon Wine Services and Storage. It was actually Paul Hart from Rex Hill and uh, Jerry Gilmer from the Abbey that encouraged us to do this. And so we started a bonded wine storage facility and that kind of moved into transportation fulfillment and other services for the industry. Um, we started Northwest Wine Company as Laurent and Danielle approached us in 2003 and made that sister company. And uh, it certainly wasn't because I had a passion for wine. Uh, it, was, it was a business opportunity. I liked the services. And I liked building something uh, slowly without thinking about it, you know, home run right out the gate, mm -hmm. but actually establishing relationships and being in it for the long haul. So that being said, in 2006, I started Eminent Domain uh, Wines as a label. And uh, in 2008, purchased this property. 2009, planted the vineyard here on Ribbon Ridge and uh, have been adding the tasting room, the winery, the residence, a uh, little farm, another vineyard on Ribbon Ridge over the years. And it's just kind of been heading in that direction. The neat thing about our, our first vintage, 06, was we purchased the fruit from uh, Eola Amity, and it was pure pomard. And I did that because Dick Shea, in early 2000s, made a pomard that just uh, knocked my socks off. And so I, I, liked, uh, I liked the clone. And stylistically, I discovered I really liked a little more ripe fruit. Uh, and so that's always been kind of the direction we've taken it is with riper, bigger, bolder pinots. So take us back a little bit before, we'll come back to all of that, of course, but take us back a little bit before, what did you do before wine? Tell us about uh, life before, where you, where you were born and raised, and, and what uh, you were doing before you got into wine. Uh, I was born in Hillsboro, Beaverton area, and lived there till I was uh, 12, and then moved to Lake Oswego. Uh, but the early years, we were on a farm. We had uh, alfalfa, wheat, and cattle, and pigs, gardens, um, and I just fell in love with the farming side. So uh, I wanted to stay with that. I wanted to, at a point I left and went and did more business, but inevitably the, the dirt gets in your blood and that's what you want to go back to, or at least I did, and I always knew it. So when I I uh, was in college, I went to uh, Oregon State for a year and uh, was actually on academic probation. I was a business major and I think I spent almost all the time on academic probation because I didn't take business courses. <laughs> I took ag courses and I just enjoyed agriculture. Um, it was uh, definitely something that stuck with me and still is. I still, I, I can't help myself but to continue and look at other potential vineyard properties and uh, see if it's feasible to plant a little bit more somewhere else in this AVA or a different AVA. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah. So I know the name Eminent Domain comes from a real life incident. So tell us about, about that incident and, <laughs> and uh, kind of what led you into the, the thought of even a wine business. Um, Eminent Domain came about in the early 2000s. Uh, I had owned a property with my sister, a commercial office building, a small one over in downtown Portland around Portland State University and Portland State University was funding the light rail there, the expansion, and in the hopes of uh, adding uh, high density housing, uh, less parking required, having the light rail there, and some retail and, and classrooms. And so when they funded that, they were able to utilize Metro, TriMet, to uh, take our building by literally just 
wrapping around our building and clipping 13 feet by one foot off the edge and saying it was, uh, it was needed. So we lost the property through eminent domain. So that was always, uh, that, that property was sold, and sold, taken and reinvested and that became this property here on Ribbon Ridge. I, um, and with that, the label eminent domain came about as just a play on words, adding the E with domain. And I always thought it, it's either going to be loved or hated. Uh, you know, the, the name is uh, obviously tongue in cheek, but it's not so whimsical. I hope that that people understand that we are definitely taking this seriously. So that's how that came about. So when the take me through the steps of even of, of the thought of Oregon wine service. You mentioned Paul Hart and Jerry Gilmer as being kind of the people pointing you in that direction. At what point did you even become aware of the need for wine storage or the thought that that could be something you could do? Um, the bonded wine storage part, a lot of paperwork to get it up and going, but it made great sense. So. Paul had sat down with John and I and told us about the need in the industry, that there was not adequate storage at the Abbey and the Abbey didn't want to keep expanding. So we met with uh, Jerry Gilmer and Jerry graciously told us, you know, we'll send you any overflow we have. Uh, they're, they're not competitors, they're, they're there to facilitate the industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, much like the rest of our industry, they, they're well, they were there for us. They helped us get uh, up and going, and, and hopefully we helped them out as well. Jerry's still a very good friend of ours. Uh, but there's no competition in the Oregon wine industry, in my opinion. It's the most collaborative industry, whether it's on the storage side or other. Uh, I found this always been um, an amazing environment. It has changed a bit over the years. But still, by and large, I think all the, all the players are still very much about uh, a long-term outlook in this industry mm -hmm. and making things better so that we all can produce better wine and uh, flourish. Um, yeah. What were the logistics of starting that kind of company? <laughs> what, what, what did you not know about sort of wine storage that you needed to know? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> uh, I. I knew nothing going into it. I was coming out of a commercial uh, real estate background in cell towers, working in the cell tower industry. And uh, I knew nothing about the storage side or reporting uh, <laughs> to the TTB or OLCC or otherwise. So there was an awful lot to learn. Mm -hmm. um, but we knew there was a need and I always rely on people more experienced than I hiring people that are hardworking and that uh, know more than I do. And that's a lot, a lot of people. <laughs> so bring in their expertise and lean on them mm -hmm. and recognize your weaknesses and recognize somebody else's strengths and, and utilize that to your advantage. Uh, there are many things that I don't do well to this day that I rely on uh, my staff, my wife, and others to make happen. I literally get myself into something and I hand over a, a basket of a mess and say, here, clean it up. Uh, you know, you really sh should, in my opinion, check your ego. Uh, this is an industry that's full of all different personalities, but inevitably, I don't think any of us know everything, so rely on others. I've, I've used the the phrase often regarding Harry Peterson Nedry. When I was planting up here in 2009, I went to Harry and I asked him which rootstocks were working best. And rather than go out and have my own idea and plow forward on that, I went to the neighbor who planted 24 years earlier and got his input and planted the rootstock and with a little struggles, it's done awesome. So again, standing on the shoulders of giants, recognizing what others before us have done, there's a menu there. We don't have to go out and recreate things. What was your initial impression of the Oregon wine industry? Uh, coming from a commercial real estate background, it was unlike anything I'd seen. I mean, imagine that you're, you're 
neighbors that are, are selling the same wines as you at, at similar price points uh, are helping you bring in customers. They're telling you where they made mistakes. Um, again, it's, it's just a collaboration. And I've, I've not heard of many industries that, that can compare to this. It is uh, unlike anything else. And still to this day, I'll go out and have beers with some good friends, and they're always generous with, with uh, information, as I try to be as well. So what's the process for you then from, you're, you're, you're in the wine industry now, but doing, doing storage and facilitation. What makes you take the next step and start a label? <laughs> The label was uh, a conversation with a friend, and it was an idea we had for starting up a new business. And I said that I would go ahead and start this label, and if it didn't work out, if, if it worked out uh, for us to do this project, then we had a label to start with. We already had something in the bottle, and we had something to put on a shelf. Uh, if it didn't, I'd figure it out. So we started with just 150 cases, and stayed around 150 cases to 300 cases for the first probably four or five years, right in that area, probably four years. And uh, my wife or I would literally go into Portland and throw a couple cases in the back of the car and start sampling restaurants when they were willing to see us. And many and most weren't really willing to see us come back on Monday between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. or whatever their hours are for these things. Uh, made appointments, came back, and we got some people to pour our wines. Um, and just uh, that allowed us to keep going. But there was a point where we seriously considered being done with the, the label and uh, selling fruit and everything just kind of went the other way. Mm -hmm. instead, of, instead of backing away and and all the lifestyle, as busy as it is, is um, it's a great, it's a, it's, for me, uh, it's an amazing blend. It, it lets me do business, it lets me do farming, it lets me do marketing, it lets me see people. I, I get, you know, when we started this, my wife and I were so busy, we said, well, we just don't have any room for any more friends. No more friends. You know? <laughs> and lo and behold, we've made so many friends out of the tasting room, and it just keeps going. It's like, uh, so yeah, I can't imagine ever leaving it. Uh, and, and that being said, I don't really want to grow it much either. Mm -hmm. We're sitting around 3,000 cases, 2,500, 3,000 annually. And I don't have any desire to grow the label to 10,000 cases or be heavily reliant on distribution. We're 99% sold out of the tasting room and online. Uh, a fraction of 1% goes to Oregon distribution. And to, to be beholden to the distributors, to rely on them to do the sales and all and sell at FOB doesn't really I'd, I'd like to venture into it again a little bit, maybe, but you know, select markets that I want to work, like Hawaii. <laughs> I may never sell a bottle, but doggone it, I work that market like hell. <laughs> um, so I, I've had a couple of jobs where I've worked in a cubicle, and I've decided I would never go back to that. And so for me, I get time on the tractor. Uh, I, get, I used to have time with the pigs and the chickens. Uh, still have time to just be outside and do the things I want to do. Um, it's not, a, it, it's a great variety of things mm -hmm. as, and seasonally a huge variety of things also. Um, there are stresses always with farming, you know, we, I knew better growing up on a farm, you know, it's weather related issues come up, birds and other things, uh, smoke. Um, you roll with the punches, you make the best decisions you can, and you always have to be thinking about next year and what we could do to prevent or minimize these issues. Um, yeah, this is an industry where nobody should wear rose-colored glasses. You know, you better be thinking worst case scenario at every turn and be prepared for them. That doesn't make you a pessimist, it just means you're a realist. And that way you're, you're being proactive, not reacting in, in, uh, too late. Uh, 
<laughs> when you started the label, uh, you mentioned you you kind of had a you had a wine that had kind of opened your eyes to, to Pomard, specifically Pinot Noir. What were you th sort of thinking in terms of uh, this is what I want to produce and this is how I want to sell it? You know, I, I had an advantage being in the storage industry and working with Northwest Wine Company in that I got to see everything all the way through, and I could see people's wine sitting in a wine storage facility and not moving. I could see who was selling through inventory fast, who seemed to be struggling, and then I had to make my own guesses on why. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, a work in progress. I, I, I didn't really have a, uh, perhaps a really clear idea on the marketing, hence my wife and I walking through Portland and selling wine door to door. Um, but uh, it took shape over a few years and it just kind of, like I say, it eventually happened. Mm -hmm. The tasting room was really a big deal to me. Putting this up here in, in the most beautiful setting, um, I think that people really react to being around the vines and seeing what we do. And they'll oftentimes see me on a tractor and uh, I think they get the, the reality of what we do isn't all um, you know, sitting around drinking wine, it's actually an awful lot of hard work. And we live above the winery, we are working. You're always working, mm -hmm. you're always available. And uh, that may be something I'd reconsider if I had this all to do over again, is that I, I don't think I'd make myself quite as available. <laughs> That's the next chapter of life, I'll, I'll figure that out. <laughs> uh, another thing I wouldn't do is I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have named this winery after an unfortunate instance in my life because I get to relive the story of Emin Domain and how it happened every week. And it's, uh, <laughs> as one person I talked to pointed out, it's like, yeah, you, it's almost like you, you chose the, the, one of your worst experiences and then you, you put it out there so you could relive it like bitter divorce mm -hmm. or you know, a horrible <laughs> disease. It's like, yeah, that's, that probably wasn't the smartest <laughs> thing. Tell me about your, your first wines uh, produced under the label, uh, how you thought they compared and fared, and, and what you sort of saw as the, what did the, the Pinot Noir market look like at that <laughs> point to you? Uh, well, it was 2006 vintage. Back then it was, uh, just back then, uh, 15 years ago, it was very different. Uh, we. Selling direct to consumer meant selling to our friends and family. Um, so it was going largely retail and not having uh, any wholesalers, distributors or anything. So um, the first wines we made were, like I said, stylistically just what I wanted. I wanted something that I, I'd gotten some, some feedback from my friends that are uh, like-minded to me at this time, where I didn't know a lot about wine. And I didn't like the leaner and greener Pinots. I liked ripe Pinot. So that's why I leaned on Pomard immediately, it was something that was a bit bigger. Uh, one of my friends compared uh, the lighter Pinots to sweat socks, and I thought that was offensive, but uh, I understood where they were coming from. They liked Cabernet. And so they were having a hard time getting their head around a Pinot. Uh, I kind of wondered how many of the people, if they didn't, if they didn't know Pinots, would gravitate that way. So, um, yeah, Pomard was kind of it, and then from there, it's you know Vadensville, and mm -hmm. and then you can go into all kinds of uh, other uh, brighter red fruits to blend. Uh, that's been fun learning. I am not a winemaker. Uh, I rely on currently Drew Voigt is uh, my uh, consulting winemaker making the wine here um, and I rely on his expertise. If I were to do it, uh, it would be a disaster. I have an eclectic taste. I would do something funky and barnyardy and, and something that people would scratch their head about and I'm sure some odd wine cult out there would, would wrap their hands around it but beyond that, the vast majority of the people would probably not and rightfully not want to drink it. Uh, so I rely, as I said, I rely on people that know more than I do. Whether it's uh, helping me manage the wine club or uh, one of our rental homes, uh, VRBOs, or 
uh, wine production and farming. Uh, we use a consulting uh, vineyard managers that come in and, and help us make decisions in the vineyard. Um, I'm getting uh, a better knowledge of these things and able to contribute more and more. Uh, I never want to be the winemaker and I never want to be the vineyard manager. I want to rely on others that are going to classes and staying more up with the latest and greatest. Mm -hmm. um, I don't learn, something I discovered as I'm in my late 50s now, is that I don't learn by reading. I don't retain things, I learn by doing. So it's a very difficult way to uh, learn about winemaking if you can't retain what you just read in a book. But if I get in the winery and I work the harvest and I pay attention, I can glean little bits here and there and it sticks. But again, I have to be hands-on to make that happen. And that goes for all of my business practices is to, to read something uh, isn't, isn't how I retain things. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd have known that when I was younger. Um, but uh, anyway, <laughs> I made it through college, barely. <laughs> they, they might have kept you off of academic probation had you, had yeah, you known Exactly, that. yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, the big step, the big kind of step for you, the, the, the property, the tasting room, all the things that came up. So tell me about this space. How did you find it? What about it? Why, why did you choose it and what did you kind of, did you foresee it turning into what it's turned into? <laughs> I, I had been looking for years and things were always out of my price range or I didn't have the money to develop them. I could afford the property but I couldn't afford to develop it so I didn't know what to do. This property was owned by Isabel uh, DuPont mm -hmm. and uh, she sold it to me. It was uh, at the time an old double wide and a metal barn um, and uh, a bunch of straw, a bunch of hay around it, and that was about it. it uh, I immediately set out to plant it and uh, we did just that. It was, uh, the views are insanely beautiful and the land, knowing what Harry had done next door, planting in the early 80s up here at Ridgecrest, you knew the fruit was amazing. It was, it was absolutely amazing. So uh, again, Harry, Harry did the heavy lifting, uh, among others out here, obviously. But as far as my neighbors, you know, he showed what could be done and it was kind of uh, a no-brainer to, to see what this property could do. We did purchase another uh, 12 acres down the road here on Ribbon Ridge. And uh, if it weren't for frost this year, we'd be having a harvest, but uh, it'll be very light this year on fourth leaf. Um, this building, or these buildings, were, I wanted to keep something that was very much Oregon. And uh, I like the industrial look, a lot of uh, iron and concrete and some wood. Uh, I, the art on the walls is old town Portland. Mm -hmm. uh, Despite the fact that I lost my property through eminent domain, I still am from here, and I still am proud of Oregon, and Portland is, is part of that, uh, despite its changes as well. So the, the structures uh, architecturally are just something I thought fit in with the area. I didn't want to be anything but Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, there's beautiful examples of other things that are more Napa-esque or Tuscan, and that's wonderful. Uh, but I wanted to really embrace where I'm from. I'm, like, I'm, Bald Peak is right out, out here. As a Cub Scout, we used to clean the trails. You know, I, I, I have not made it very far from this spot. I've seen a bit of the world, but I always come back here, and this is, this is my home, uh, culturally and logistically. Uh, so, yeah, I wanted to keep something that, that my neighbors wouldn't look at and say, who's he trying to be? just trying to be myself. I'm trying to be what we are here and be proud of it. My wife, many years ago, uh, she, she likes warm weather and wanted to spend more time in California and pot potentially move there. And I thought, why would you ever want to leave this place? I mean, in the summer, typically, this is, this is where people come. People come from all over the world and certainly all over the U.S. Every day in the tasting room, it's, it's filled with people that are not just from Portland. They're from all over. People come here to vacation, and it was funny as a kid, as a young man, that 
wasn't the way. And uh, I, I get what my wife was talking about. We were uh, culturally a little behind. Uh, certainly nightlife was a little behind. Uh, but now it's, it's uh, we've been discovered and uh, what, what took you so long. Um, it's, it's just where I want to be. You mentioned kind of the humble, the humble beginnings of selling wine. Uh, <laughs> tell me how uh, that's evolved for you. Uh, how, how do you sell your wine now? What, what are kind of the strategies you use? Uh, what have you found uh, is the most effective way of selling wine? Well, for me, we have a beautiful location. And we, there, there's a lot of great wines out there. And I, I, despite the fact that I like to make bigger wines, my cellar is full of all kinds of Pinots that are of, of different uh, styles. Mm -hmm. uh, I love them just because I don't want to make that or I don't look for that type of following. doesn't mean that I don't go out and find my friend's wine and it's so different and it's amazing. Um, where are we? Selling wine. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, we started out just the going to retailers and going through friends and family. After a while, a uh, good friend, Rob Alstrand, teamed up with me and we started doing some distribution. And because of the 2013 vintage, uh, the, the phone stopped ringing. You couldn't, you couldn't get a call back. And uh, that was disheartening. That was the part I didn't really understand. I'd been told that uh, distributors would sometimes get your wine in other states and then not pay you. And then you'd have no asset and no money. So I, I knew that I wasn't very fond of that business model, but uh, it seemed to happen few and far between. So uh, we decided to go ahead and do some through distribution. And 13 happened, wasn't great. In fact, I think out of 13 or 14 distributors, one of them talked to me that year. Nobody else would return a call or an email or anything. So 14 rolled around and we got a very kind score from Wine Spectator and the phone started ringing off the hook. And I told everybody, no, we didn't have a license in your state to sell, well, we'll pay for your license. No, I don't want to do that anymore. This is, this is a model that didn't work. It's kind of a two-way street. And now that I have a product that you'd love to sell, I, I don't have a lot of it and I don't, I don't need to do that. So. Um, we just decided to stay with direct to consumer, uh, by and large. Uh, price points are, I'd say, fairly average for the industry. Um, packaging has gotten horribly expensive. Uh, it's going to be hard to stay where we're at with all these expenses going up, but um, it's working. Mm -hmm. And we're not sitting on old inventory. Um, yeah, a lot to be proud of. With all of the, the development in the area, of course, and all the vineyards and all the, all the wineries up here and all the taste rooms up here, um, you mentioned kind of you make a, a different style of wine. You, you're aiming for a different style of wine. Do you find that consumers notice that? Are they attracted to your wine because it's a little bit different? Or do you feel like you find yourself um, sort of explaining what makes you special? <laughs> um, I, I unapologetically explain why I do what I do. Uh, it's it in going larger sometimes it uh, I think you lose some of the the subtle complexities of the wine, but uh, it's like I said it's it's the style that I like. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, uh, being already a, about a month late and frost damage up here, uh, we could be making quite light wines or maybe just rosé. We don't know yet, um, but uh, it's nature first. We don't want to over manipulate anything. And if, if we had the ability to hang long, uh, we would. Mm -hmm. We would ripen them up as much as possible, give them to shrivel. Uh, but this year, that's probably not reality. And then even if we could hang long, the birds will probably be dropping down from Canada and, and eating what we have. So, uh, you know, look at nature, look at the, what the harvest gives us. Mm -hmm. um, now, in telling, telling my customers our story and why I do what I do is, is not that 
my way is the right way, it's just the way I choose. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I, I love trying other people's wines and just being, and, and, uh, envious is not the right word, I guess, but it is. I, I'm like, and how did you do that? That is awesome, I wish I did that. Uh, it's, it's a great industry to be in where you can do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, uh, as you look back now from where you are here, what are the biggest sort of uh, milestone accomplishments for eminent domain so, since its inception? What are the biggest things, for, the biggest steps for you and the, the moments maybe you look back on with, with most pride? Um, getting, getting a couple good scores did help me feel better about what I was doing because it was an affirmation that I was on the right track, or at least some people thought I was on the right track. Because I can go ahead and tell myself I'm doing something right all day long. My wife will tell you I'm not, but she's wrong. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it did mean a lot to me to have the industry support me at that. Uh, and that being said, my friends in the industry, um, having, having their affirmation, having their support is, is huge. Um, milestone wise you know doing enough sales and all to be able to support a winery not have to make it off site anymore uh, these things meant a lot to me to be able to do that uh, it's it's there's no quick and easy path in this industry if you know you're, if you're growing up from the ground up it's literally you definitely walk before you run you have to make some wine, see if you can market it, see if you can sell it. You know, if you're starting out like I did, it wasn't that I came in with a big check and said, I just am going to do this. I had to make sure I had a, a plan. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people out there making great wine, but how are they going to sell it at a margin that's acceptable? Uh, custom Crush facilities, now the wineries doing Custom Crush, are an amazing resource. It really does allow somebody to come in with a minimal investment mm -hmm not small, uh, but less, and figure out if they're on the right track. And uh, figure out their style, figure out their marketing, and see if they can grow it. Mm -hmm. But to come out here and buy some land and, and plant grapes and build a winery before you know, can I sell what I'm making at a price point that makes sense? Uh, I, I, I think that sometimes people are successful in one industry and come out here and think they can just do it all over again. It's, it's a great lifestyle. And uh, if you can afford to do that, I highly recommend it. But most of us can't. You have to make, uh, you have to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. And this is a very expensive industry to make ends meet in. The equipment, the tractors, everything we do is just uh, is constant mm -hmm. and maintenance. Yeah. So I want to talk about uh, 2020 for a minute. Uh, obviously, the last, that, that, the, the beginning of a couple of interesting we, years. We don't have to if you don't want to. <laughs> we can just, let's go to 21. 20, 20, and then we can just skip 22 too. Uh, so uh, I'm curious about in 2020, uh, with the, both the pandemic uh, as, a, as a place you're, sell, you're, you're selling your wine direct to consumer, obviously that to change, those kinds of changes. And then of course the 2020 harvest on the other end of it. Tell me about sort of the, the decisions you had to make that year, the, the impact of those decisions and sort of how you came out the other side uh, of, of 2020 and of that harvest. Uh, yeah, 2020 was quite the surprise. You know, everything is just rolling along perfect, and then it wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the smoke, when it, it rolled over us, uh, it was absolutely crazy. And then the next day, it sat down on top of us. Uh, so we do purchase fruit from Yola Amity, uh, from McMinnville AVA, and Shehalem, and all of them handled it differently. One vineyard in particular didn't handle it very well. We tried to produce the fruit. We made a decision up front that we weren't going to stick it to the farmers. That to say that the fruit was bad and just not try wasn't, um, wasn't fair to the farmers in a long-term relationship that you hope to have. So we, I heard stories that people decided to do away with the 2020 vintage without doing any trials or anything, literally, 
because they were so sure it was going to be bad and because they had excess inventory and they were able to go ahead and write it out on old inventory. Um, we didn't have that luxury. We could have, but we really wanted to try and we wanted to make it right with the farmers. Mm -hmm. So we had one vineyard that didn't make it. We put it to barrel. We couldn't deal with it. Um, we gave it back to a winery and they dealt with it. Um, we did carbon fining and by and large that took the edge off. Uh, you know, with any fining or filtering, you take out some good, you take out some bad. Uh, it's not surgical. And in this case, 2020s throughout, I can try them, and most of them you can tell they're 2020s. Um, not all, but most all. Uh, our wines, by and large, are very good. Um, but we don't have that much of it. We, because we had to do away with some fruit, and we were already on a, a fairly small fruit set, we did uh, about 45% less than normal. So we don't have much 2020 to sell. Um, which isn't a problem. Now, 21s, fantastic. Everything is good, we just got done blending and it's, it's an epic vintage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. every, every vintage should be 21, but you know, <laughs> we're, now we're into 22 and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing for 22 at this point? What is it, how does it sort of feel at this point? Well, we're, uh, on the established vines, we're leaving uh, uh, more shoots on the on the heads, and so we're and we're seeing some decent fruit sets. So we're going to end up with an okay amount of fruit here at the estate. On the young vines down the road, there's going to be next to nothing. So eight and a half acres, nine acres of very very little fruit. Probably or possibly won't be worth harvesting. Uh, we'll we'll see. Uh, again, because we're so late, about a month late or so, uh, I anticipate if the summer continues on this path that we'll, um, we'll be making those leaner and greener uh, wines that I was talking about. And that could be beautiful, complex, because they're not going to be cropped heavy, obviously. Uh, they're going to be uh, a bit lighter cropped up here. And we should end up, uh, hopefully, with less but some very good fruit. Mm -hmm. We also, again, purchased from EOL Amity and others, and they largely weren't affected. So uh, we could end up with enough fruit, but again, stylistically, this I want it to be vintage specific. I don't want to manipulate. It, it is what it is. I want you to be able to try it and say, wow, that's a 22. And hopefully we'll do something that'll be worthy. You talked earlier about uh, having Drew as your winemaker at the moment and, and, and other, other, other winemakers in the past. Uh, how do you, what do you look for in that relationship when you're, when you're hiring a winemaker to make wines for you? What are you looking for and how much input do you have, do you want to have on sort of the, 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 the finished product? Well, again, I, I always say I know nothing. I, I have a, an opinion, but, you know, use your education and tell me I'm wrong. You know, explain why, and hopefully I'll learn something from it. Um, I get involved, uh, I think I get a lot more involved in the vineyard and the decisions in the vineyard. I always said farming first. Uh, you, you can't produce good wine without good fruit. If we do our part out here, it makes the job so much easier for Drew. Uh, Drew selects the oak. Uh, I, I'm just learning about oak still to this day. There's a lot to know. Um, I call the pick dates basically, I work with Drew on that, and uh, Drew's like-minded. He knows what I'm after, and we definitely hang late uh, as much as possible. Um, I've actually been able to convince him to add whole cluster in more and more. Uh, it's great in our estate wines and others, it just, uh, I absolutely love it, uh, and that's been, you know, you say maybe he's learned a little something, but uh, I'd say maybe I've changed his opinion. I know he's watching. I know you're watching, <laughs> Drew. Um, <laughs> so again, I rely on others, and Drew. Drew gets where I where I'm going. I like to include the whole crew when it comes to blending. We'll do the first couple, but the last, the final blending, will in, in, include my wife, uh, Heather, and uh, Camille, and Phil, and Pat, and. Uh, we'll all sit down and, and it's really fun to include everybody and hopefully they get an education out of it, but as well, 
uh, they're the consumers. Mm -hmm. And to have their input is really nice. So we talked earlier about your sort of initial impressions of, of Oregon wine and, and some of the, so the, sort of the through line of, of collegiality that, you, that you've seen. What are the biggest changes you've seen uh, mm -hmm. in the industry since becoming a part of it? Uh, well, there's a lot more of us. Um, used to be in the early days, in 02, 03, I'd walk through the, the winery or the, the storage facility and I, I, I knew everybody's wines. I knew who the winemaker was, I knew who the owner was, I mean everybody, and that went for years. And then all of a sudden, second labels started popping up. And that, that was an amazing event in itself to see this, this happen. And now it's just uh, a lot more wineries popping up, a lot more vineyards. Uh, as always, people from all different backgrounds. It's not just people that have come out of UC Davis that had this vision and, and they're following this, this path. It's, it's people that made their money in other industries and are coming in with a different perspective. And I think it's really valuable. I think it's great that we, that we have uh, as broad a perspective as possible. Um, and I said it again with the wines. It's, there's something for everybody. And because I chose this style of building and, and architecture and this style of wine, I'm grateful that there are all different wines out there because there's all different customers. We have people that come up here that may find my wines you know, not to their liking, and then we have people that come up and, and uh, love it. And I, we have to figure out then to uh, love to recommend other wineries. So you kind of get a feel for where people are at, what they're gravitating to, and, and they say, hey, do you have any recommendations? Well, if you like this, why don't you go over here to Fairsing or Colleen Clemens or Brickhouse or wherever. There's all kinds of great wineries out here, and I got an amazing list of neighbors, and maybe down the valley to Salem or whatever, but depending on how long they're here and what they can get to, it's really nice to kind of give that input. Um, well, kind of on the role of, or excuse me, on the topic of your neighbors, obviously this area has grown up a lot uh, even since you've been here. So tell me, tell me about that, uh, the changes in Ribbon Ridge and, and the area, and what uh, do you see happening next here? I, I could see a few more wineries popping up around here or tasting rooms. Ribbon Ridge is very dry. We monitor our water consumption. Uh, a lot. We ping the wells depth, our aquifer, every month. Uh, we, we watch uh, our consumption like crazy. Uh, so that is the one concern out here is that we all are good stewards. Um, most of us are organic up here, but there are a few that aren't. Uh, that's, that's nice. That's a nice change. Um, what changes? Well, I'd like to think that they'll pave our road, but that's <laughs> That's probably never going to happen. Um, it is awfully quaint and nice, keeps people going fairly slow. Uh, but um, yeah, I think we'd all like to have a paved road out here. <laughs> uh, I, personally, I'd like to see more tasting rooms. I, I like seeing more variety. And we've got some distilleries out here now. We've got two distilleries out here on Ribbon Ridge. Um, nice change. Again, something for everybody. Um, I like seeing the better, uh, nicer, nicer restaurants in town, and uh, yeah, very positive changes. Uh, as far as the people, everybody's been so pleasant. I, I can't think of uh, any negative uh, as far as the new people coming in, from the largest to the smallest. Um, yeah, something for everybody. Something for everybody. Uh, what about as you look ahead for Oregon wine on a, on a larger scale? What does the next, say, decade of Oregon wine look like from your perspective? I think a lot of it's going to well, obviously do with the economy right now. We've got a lot of changes going on, but the, the climate, uh, you know, last year was, was so hot and uh, the year before was smoke and this year is rain and frost. Um, yeah, I, I, it really depends on what the climate does. Uh, 
I don't, I, I'd love to see direct to consumer shipping and distribution eased up as far as the restrictive laws. Um, that, that's one huge thing that I don't know if it'll ever happen because of lobbyists, but uh, yeah, that would be one of the biggest game changers. Uh, I think tourism out here is just gonna continue to grow. You know, the city is moving further and further out and uh, for, for every city, not just, just here. Um, I think more and more people just means more and more tourists and, and uh, they're welcome. It's really, it's, it's fun to add to their trip. So we've got this uh, uh, Airbnb down the road uh, at the other vineyard. And to be able to see people from all over, they come in and they're looking for recommendations on where to have their appointments and what restaurants to go to and is there a good hiking trail and what, what's up the gorge. Uh, it's really neat to meet these people and give them a little advice and hopefully steer them towards a good vacation. So what about for your own future as you look ahead? What, what comes next for you and for Eminent Domain? I would like to work a little less. This is my goal. Last year, my goal was to nap more. I failed. I absolutely failed. It was serious. I was gonna, I was gonna find a nap like every other day and it just didn't happen. Uh, I'm old. Um, <laughs> this year, I really, uh, I bought a fishing boat. So my hope is to start fishing more regularly and with that, drag the kids out. They hate fishing. Uh, and get them to do things with me out at the ocean. Um, I'd, I'd like to slow down. I'd like to, again, rely on my crew to take on more responsibility and to allow me to have a little more time away. Um, that's, that doesn't mean I won't be here most of the time. That doesn't mean... I. I I don't see myself doing a lot of, or any, long trips. I'm really thinking just more, more getting out and, and being unavailable, setting my phone down and my iPad down, and knowing that everything will be taken care of in my absence. Mm -hmm. So uh, handing off more responsibilities. And, and uh, I don't think I micromanage, but I, uh, I do want to enable people to make decisions. Mm -hmm. we, I've got a great crew, and I feel like I uh, compensate them well, and not well enough. I, I honestly, I think they're doing an amazing job, but uh, I think I give them very good compensation by the standards, and I would like to retain them, have them learn more, reward them for, their, for what they can bring, and with that, catch a nice salmon, have a glass of Chardonnay, and, and uh, yeah, just get some time away. You mentioned uh, that the size of the winery, the size of the, of the production is about where you want it to be right now. Do you have anything in mind for the, with the, it comes to the label in terms of, of changing, or, or is this kind of what you want to be going forward? I think this is it. I mean, honestly, uh, I, I always want to have more control over where my fruit comes from, meaning I want to have the ownership mm -hmm. and make the decisions in the, in the vineyards. Um, every time that's, uh, you know, that's a big financial burden. And with water uh, issues, you have to select the right area now or right practices to make that work. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see beyond the possibility of purchasing more land and developing another vineyard, I don't see any other changes coming. I, I, like, I like the fact that we're uh, uh, very approachable. People come up here and they say we're all relaxed and, and it's a nice setting and it's, it's just comfortable. Mm -hmm. I want that where people feel at ease to be themselves and, and know that we're not going to ridicule them if they ask a silly question. All right, so all the questions that I have for you, anything I didn't ask that I should have, anything we didn't cover that you wanted to cover? Is this the break time? We're going to have four hours to go. <laughs> yeah, we'll be <laughs> back tomorrow nice. for more. No, okay, no. great. Yeah, there's so much more to say. Uh, no, I, I can't think of anything. I, I, if I haven't stressed it enough, my, my wife and family have been... Uh, 
very supportive and let me go on this tangent, this, this career path. And I'm grateful for that, and I'm grateful for my staff. They're just the greatest people, both as friends and uh, as uh, employees. We literally, uh, we work upstairs, so I'll come upstairs and make their lunch in our kitchen. And uh, uh, Camille's son, Maceo, was, uh, my wife babysat him for a few hours while she worked because Merritt had to be on a tractor. Uh, you know, it's a very family, collaborative, uh, amazing community. Mm -hmm. I, I can't, uh, you can't replace this. Of all things, I, I've thought about the next chapter of my life and what I'd like to do, but inevitably, if I ever did decide to leave this, I could never come back to it. There's no replacing what we have, and that is, that's a great reality check right there is, uh, you know, you may be tired today and think you need a break and you need to make a change, it's not going to get better. This is it. It's a pretty fantastic way to wrap this up. So thank, thank you, you so much, Jeff, for the time, for your hospitality up here, uh, for making time for us. And we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. All right. Thank you. Thank you.